Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Bangan. So, um, first thing I should say, Friday was a very sad day. Um, only three people showed up for class. And since homework was due on Thursday night, well, I saw a bunch of people handing things in at midnight. So I've decided, um, I've decided that next homework, instead of being due Thursday night, it's going to be due Friday at, I don't know, 5 p.m. Uh, that way, you know, if you want to be doing homework at midnight on Thursday, you're still free to do it, but you don't have to. I hope, I mean, I hope it doesn't ruin your Friday. Uh, you can always do the homework on Thursday, I guess. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So, where were we? Where we were is uh, we showed that there is such a thing as the greatest common divisor of two polynomials. Um, so, let me remind you what this uh, says. Um, okay, so we have a field and we have, so this is just the, the theorem I proved uh, Friday. So we have two polynomials. Then um, the, first of all, the GCD the greatest common divisor of P and Q exists. And remember, this means um, this means that it's a it's a divisor. It's common to P and Q. And greatest means that every other divisor of both P and Q is a divisor of the GCD. Um, and further, there is. Uh, there is this identity. Where we can find two polynomials, basically we can write the GCD as a linear combination of the polynomials. And you might see this referred to as the Zeus identity. <clears throat> Which, like most theorems that have a name, means it probably wasn't discovered by the Zeus. I don't actually know. <clears throat> okay. So um, maybe. This seems, um, I don't know. It's, I mean, we don't have that many examples of rings, so maybe you would expect that this holds. This happens. Such a thing happens always. Like, why wouldn't there be a greatest common divisor? So why wouldn't we have this identity, which basically came from division with uh, remainder? So, let me show you a couple examples um, showing that this doesn't have to work in other situations. Um, so, <clears throat> the first example I have is um, just if you look at polynomials in two variables, um, you can't write the Zeus identity. Uh, at least you can't always write it. Uh, so, for example, so. Um, Take two polynomials in two variables, x and y. Uh, so what do you think is the greatest common divisor of x and y? One. One, yeah. Um, I'm not going to, I mean, it's pretty easy to convince yourself, I think. 
um, polynomials into variables, you can measure the degree in X and in Y. So I guess using both of those, you could see it has to have the greatest common divisor as degree zero, both in X's, in the X's and in the Y's. Um, so one, one thing that I, we will prove in the future, but uh, let, the polynomial in two variables always has GCDs. Um, but the point is um, that we don't have such an identity uh, like above. So you can't find R and S such that we will get one as a linear combination of X and Y. Um, why is this? I suppose the only way you could try to do this is if you have some ring where um, where X and Y each have some order. And so you set R of X and Y to be um, effectively X to the minus one. So whatever power of X that happens to be and then S of X, Y to be Y to whatever power you need to be. And then you get one plus one, you could attach a factor of one half on each. But mm. outside of uh, rings where elements have um, a cardinality, I, I forgot the exact term, um, then that would work, or it wouldn't okay. work for a ring that's not like that. So it has to, I mean, you're right that this is a solution if I could, if X and Y had, had inverses, but I mean, they don't, um, because this is a polynomial ring. X, X is not yeah. a particular element of any ring, it's just an indeterminate, it has it has no, there's nothing special about X. X cubed is not one, like you were saying. There's no, X has no order. There, there's no, there's no inverse anywhere to be found. So, okay, but this sort of shows that there's a solution. Um, that there's a solution that doesn't work. But that doesn't mean there couldn't be other solutions. So, you know, if I start writing some nonsense polynomial, like, how can you be sure? I mean, it's not going to work. But how can you be sure that you can never get one with polynomials? Uh, one thing, one thing you can do with polynomials, uh, you know, since X has no nothing special about it, is you can you can plug in you can plug in anything you want. If, if an identity is true for polynomials, it's gonna be true when you plug in a particular value. Is there any value you can plug in for X and or Y to make make your life easy? Just zero. Just zero. Thank you, Mason. Yeah. Um, the answer is. Yeah. 
if we evaluate at zero, we get zero equal one. Uh, which is a contradiction. So th there can't be any solutions to this. Uh, so there you go. There's um, the polynomial ring in two variables has no Vesuvius identity. This might be, I mean, um, well, I guess that's an example showing that it doesn't have to work, but it does have, as we will see next chapter, it does have GCDs. So it's, it's really, I mean, it's a very nice ring nonetheless. Um, so let me show you another example where GCD doesn't even make sense. Um, so this is the example. Um, the example is the integers together with root of negative five root of negative five or root of five times i. So this is the, um, the elements of this ring are, um, are numbers like this, a plus b root negative five. Um, these are all complex numbers. So you add them and multiply them like you add and multiply complex numbers. And I guess this is, um, this is indeed a ring. It's a subring of, of C. When you multiply two expressions like this, you get another expression like this. So, um, so this ring um, is, is kind of strange. Uh, I mean, it has an, the implicit property that you can take the number six, which is in, in here, and you can factor it as two plus as two times three, as you know. But you can also um, write it as a product like this: one plus root five, negative five, one minus root negative five. That's a difference of squares, so you're gonna get one squared plus five. So, um, so this is really messed up because turns out um, we'll see this in the future. Um, all of these are all of these are primes. Um, so this is basically the prime factorization that you expect to see with the integers it just doesn't work anymore because uh, I wrote something as a product of primes. Um, in two different ways. I should say they're irreducible. Meaning that they don't factor into anything non-trivial. So if we if we try to compute the GCD of six and two times one plus root five, root negative five, um, this is this is not going to exist. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> So if you believe that, I mean, what should the what, what should the GCD of these two numbers be? Well, I know I know some common factors um, of, of these two numbers. Basically, basically these two are common factors of both. Um, Divides both. 
um, but also one plus root negative five divides both. Um, and, and this is gonna mess everything up. Um, so I will let you verify yourselves that there is no, there is no divisor greater than these two. No divisor of both these numbers um, that is a multiple of two and one plus root negative five. So um, this is probably pretty unpleasant. And I mean, that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. But the reason, I mean, I'm telling you this for a reason, if I tell you polynomials have a nice property, I think you don't really appreciate how nice it is if you don't believe that things could ever go wrong. If you know things could go wrong, you appreciate them going right. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, so let's go back to polynomials. So I guess now we're in the section. The section is titled Irreducible Polynomials in the book. Okay, so um, I guess definition. Uh, that's always K is a field. So a polynomial over K is irreducible. If uh, if it can't be written as a product of two polynomials. Um, unless, <clears throat> so th there's always, you can always write a polynomial as a product of two things, like make one of them negative one, but uh, the non-trivial way to do it is if if they both have a positive degree. <clears throat> and a polynomial is reducible if you if you can write it as a product of two polynomials of smaller degree. Okay, um, so. So these are, I mean, these are basically prime numbers. Um, uh, if you, a prime number is a number that you can't write as the product of two numbers unless you make one of the factors one or negative one. And, and the main thing, so the main thing about irreducible polynomials um, is the theorem that we will see later is that just like every number, just like the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says, you can factor into irreducible prime, into primes uniquely. Uh, the fundamental um, theorem of arithmetic for polynomials, I guess, says that every polynomial uh, can be written uh, as a product of irreducibles, and it will be unique uh, up to multiplying by constants.
so um, you know, if I have a polynomial factor like this, of course, you could take that constant and moving around. But other than that, other than that doing that silly thing, um, the factorization is unique. Um, and you should think of this as being the same as saying that every every integer can be factored into primes. <clears throat> so uh, this is one reason we like reducibles. And well, examples of the reducible polynomials. Um, last week you already gave me some. some. Uh, for example, x squared plus one over the real numbers is irreducible. The reason, um, the reason is that it has no roots. You gave it to me as an example of a polynomial with no roots, but we we've say we said before. So. The thing is, if I could reduce it, um, it would be into, well, it has degree two. And um, we've seen that the reason polynomials add when you multiply them. So if this was a product of two polynomials, the degrees would have to add to two and not be zero. So it would have to be uh, a product of two degree one polynomials. But we know it has no roots. If he has a degree one factor, that means that's the same as having a root. <clears throat> so degrees polynomials of degree two and three are are pretty nice uh, to check your reducibility because at least you, if they're if they're reducible, they have a degree one factor. Um, another example. Um, you take this polynomial. It's also reducible. And the thing is, it has a V3. Uh, so if it was reducible, um, it would have to be into the degree one plus degree two or the degree two plus degree one, but either way, there's a degree one factor. So how can I know? Um, how can I know that, that it doesn't have a root? For this polynomial over the integer to mod three. You need to just check all the numbers. Check all the numbers, right? Yeah, um, this is more complicated for the real numbers when there's infinitely many, but in the integers mod three, I just need to check three numbers. The integers mod three are made of all the possible remainders you can get when you divide by three, which is zero, one, and two. Um, or, you know, there are classes or even say that two, two is negative one mod three. So, um, really, I only need to evaluate it three times. So P of zero is two, P of one is five, which is two, P of, let's say negative one, oh. 
it's uh, negative one plus one minus one plus two, which is definitely not zero. So the answer is, um, says he has no roots. So we must be irreducible. Now you have a degree four polynomial um, and it has no roots. It could be that it's the product of two degree two polynomials. Um, so like it's a, it's a bit more complicated. Checking if polynomials are irreducible is hard. <clears throat> I mean, if you're over a finite field like here, you you have a finite number of things to check, then it's pretty easy. But if you're over the rationals, um, any questions? All right, so the next topic is um, talking about, so, so far we've seen how to factor things um, over a field. I'm gonna tell you how to uh, factor polynomials over the integers, which is going to make it easier to factor things over the rationals actually. So in the book, this section is still called the reusable polynomials. I don't know, I'm not sure why. Uh, I mean, it has to do with them, I guess. So all I've said so far is about polynomials over a field and Z is not a field. Um, for example, I don't know how to do the division algorithm uh, if, the, if the polynomial in the denominator is not monic. So, so what we do actually, is realize that if we know what happens over Q, we know what happens over Z. Um, but but it's I don't know. Um, it's still it's interesting how to do this. For example, over the rationals, you can assume that every polynomial is monic because just divide by the leading coefficient. Here we can't anymore. So. Um, the first thing we're going to check is that every polynomial with rational entries, uh, we can write in a, in a special way. So we can be F, F. I guess I want to work all the others, P and Q, don't I? C and D, oh no, okay. <clears throat> so we can write it in this way. C divided by D, so a fraction, and then some polynomial. Of course, um, I need to say something. Um, all the numbers here are, are whole numbers. Um, C and D are mutually prime, so that fraction is irreducible. And also um, all the coefficients that are left have no common factor. So this is... Um, I mean, it might seem a bit silly, but it's actually super useful to realize this. So of course, you, I mean, you take a polynomial. So we can do this. I can tell you exactly what steps to take. So what letters do I use? So I start with a polynomial with rational coefficients, which means that the coefficients are fractions. Um, let's say B's and C's. So 
so um well i want to i want to ensure that this has integer coefficients so we can start by clearing denominators um so i guess you could multiply by the least common multiple of the of of the c's but i don't care just multiply by the product of all of them. So you multiply and divide by the product of all the denominators. What you will have is that the polynomial is one over some stuff. And then here you will have some other, some numbers, but they will be whole numbers. B zero will be the product of the capital B zero will be the capital of the product of little B zero and all the other denominators. <clears throat> okay, so that almost looks right, except the Bs are um, they could have a common factor. So um, what you can do now is let's say. A, let A be the greatest common divisor of all the all the Bs. So then we can write um, each B is A times something else. So I'm just going to write it. Uh, this is definitely true, but the thing is that this is an integer. Well, actually, uh, call bi divided by a, let's call it ai. So this is a times ai. So now what I have is that the polynomial is a product of some stuff. Uh, and then I have a times a naught, a, a1, capital A, a n next to the n. And and now I can pull out capital A. And now I'm essentially done. Um so let's write this fraction um, in 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 the smallest terms. So then C and D will be uh, co-prime. And finally, note that the DCD of so we took. We took the the b's here, and we had some greatest common divisor, and then we divided by this common divisor. X and should be x to the n. Oh, thank you, thank you, James. <clears throat> okay, um, so. If, if you take um, if you take these numbers and you all divide the, divide them by some common factor, the GCD is going to be divided by that common factor. So I'm saying these came from dividing the original numbers by a. So the GCD is also going to be divided by A, but the GCD was A. So I'm left with one. And, and I'm done. Um, 
so I voted. I have a fraction in front, which I can write as as uh, with with no common factors in the numerator and denominator. Every number involved is a whole number. Um, and the GCD of these coefficients is one. And that's what I wanted. And I noticed that if you if I gave you a polynomial and asked you to write it this way, this is exactly what you would do. You would clear the denominators, maybe clear them if it wasn't a concrete example, you could clear them in a more efficient way, but clear the denominators and then pull out whatever common factor you have left in the coefficients. Any questions? So, um, example, uh, what I just said, uh, say you have I have this polynomial with rational coefficients. How do I how do I write it um, as before? Um, so as before is have a fraction out front, and then have co prime. Uh, coefficients. So uh, here are denominators. Uh, the, the least common multiple of the denominators I see is four. So so what I have is six x squared plus six x plus nine. And now you have now I have integer coefficients, but the, the coefficients are not all co prime, they have a three in common. So, pull out the three. Uh, wouldn't it be 24x? Oh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. 24x. Thank you. <clears throat> so, oh, this stops updating. Why do you do this now? I'm so confused. This didn't happen the whole of last semester. What am I doing to the service? Right. Um, Let's see what we can. 24. I get to draw in the other utensil. Where's the other utensil? Good thing I'm surrounded by utensils. So, what I would like to do now is Uh, pull out the common factor here, which is which is three. Um, and if I do this, well, I have to divide and multiply by three. Ugh. 
good thing I'm doing a really easy computation. Three, and then divide everything by three, two x squared plus eight x plus three. And that's, uh, that's what I wanted to write it as a fraction times a polynomial with integer coefficients where the coefficients have uh, no common factor. What if we restart the, the app? What happens then? This is loading, right? Huh? Oh, okay. Maybe it's working. All right, let's change utensils. Okay, so um, so with this in mind, so now we're gonna show how to factor things. We're actually what we're gonna show is that being irreducible as a polynomial with q coefficients is the same as being irreducible with z coefficients. So. Um, so what we what we're trying to say is uh, take a polynomial with z coefficients. Um, so if p is um, Maybe I'm going to go the other way around. Um, oh, okay. you can feel this out. <clears throat> If P is irreducible in, in, in the integer coefficients, then it's irreducible with rational coefficients. So that's one claim. The other claim is going the other way around. If P is Irreducible with Q coefficients, then it's irreducible with integer coefficients. So, um, so first of all, so both of these things are going to turn out to be true. But the question I have first of all is, is which of these is is clear? The integers, right? Which they, they both have integers. This, you mean the second one? Oh, sorry, I misunderstood the question. So the question is, which one? Which one is? Which which one is easy to prove? If you have an irreducible thing over the integers, it's also reducible over the rationals, or it, being irreducible over the rationals makes you reducible over the integers. The second one, the right? Second one. Just consider um, the polynomial and the rationals to be some rational multiple of a, of a polynomial that's on the um, integers. I just have c over d times. Well, yeah. No, you you don't have to do that at all. So the thing is, if so, it's the second one. You're right, um, but it's. Imagine that uh, P factored, so really the contrapositive. 
is a product of two polynomials with integer coefficients, then these are automatically polynomials with rational coefficients. So P is also redu uh, reducible. And that's, that's it, that's all there is. Um, if you, you can't, um, basically you make the field larger, you can't uh, become irreducible. So if I can if, if I can factor something over the integers, that means I must be able to factor over the rationals. Um, the integers make it, uh, having fractions makes it in principle easier to factor things. Uh, so the, the thing that is not clear, although Sarah was on the right track, you write it like we were doing and see what happens. Uh, the thing that's more complicated is this one. So that's the one, that's the one we want to prove. Any questions? Um, okay, so, well, I'm gonna state it and we'll prove it on Wednesday. This is called uh, Gauss's lemma. I'm oh, sorry, I have the things in math called. So Gauss's lemma is the statement I was making, uh, the harder one. So if I'm saying that you're being irreducible over Z. Could you go back you, to the previous page just for like two okay. seconds? Sorry. Thank you. No problem. So what I'm saying is we're trying to prove that being irreducible over Z is the same as being irreducible over Q. The contrapositive of that, which as you know is equivalent, is the same as saying that being reducible over Q makes you reducible over C over Z. So Rose's lemma says exactly that. Um, let's say it's monic, although it doesn't have to be. Later we'll prove it in the, I mean, in the non-monic case. Um, say it factors as um, a product of two polynomials with rational coefficients. Then um, we then what we have is that it factors into two polynomials with integer coefficients. Um, and they have the same degree. Actually, they're multiples. So if you had something that was reducible over Q, it would be reducible over Z. This is um, a super useful theorem. Um, and well, um, that's that's it for today. I will prove this on Wednesday. Uh, you can ask me any questions you might have.